The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Scott Dawkins. Scott is the the founder, director, principal advisor at Griffin Financial Services. Uh, He was a planner over in the UK for a bunch of years before uh, coming back to Oz to to start his business. Um, Keen to pick Scott's brain and see what's uh, what's changed over the 10 years that he's been in business, uh, how he's tackled his team and business growth over the last little bit. Scott, thanks for joining us, mate. Great to be here. Man, I thought a good place to start was just around like the the evolution of your business, how it's came about um, and how you ended up where you are today. Uh, sure. Yeah, well, I guess um, <clears throat> my, my journey in financial planning actually started over in the UK um, from Adelaide originally, sort of finished my degrees, had sort of spent some time overseas and then backpacking for a little bit and wasn't um, as much as I love Adelaide, was sort of looking to sort of to get onto somewhere else. And so I went over to the UK and got picked up by um, a wealth management firm over there. Um, sort of a bit of a sink and swim kind of environment. Um, so it was very much like a baptism by fire, sort of thrown into the deep end. But um, that worked out fairly well for us. Um, within a couple of years, was actually fast tracked to sort of be a partner in that business. Um, and by you know my two year time in the UK, ended up being sort of seven and a half years, which was really only brought to an end because you know I had some young kids and wanted them to grow up in Australia. But yeah, so I think um, you know that journey, you know over in the UK was was really good. But um, I think, um, you know, like was was fortunate enough to sort of win an Advisor of the Year Award, um, you know, twice in a row just as I was sort of wrapping up my my time in the UK um, and then sort of got a good exit out of that business and used it as a chance to sort of take some downtime. So when I moved back to Australia, um, I took a year off. One, to sort of to make sure, you know, what direction I wanted to take uh, in the industry, whether I wanted to sort of stay in financial planning. And then, you know, when we made that decision, when I made that decision pretty quickly, it was sort of looking, okay, well, what do I want the business to look like? And, and you know, I think I was, um, it's one of those things where sometimes, you know, if I was in that business and I stayed in it and because it was going so well over in the UK, you really don't change things once you've got momentum. And I think the opportunity to sort of start with a, you know, like a blank sheet of paper and, to look at, okay, well, what did I like about what we were doing? Um, what didn't I like? What could I do better? What could I do differently? Um, what do I want the business to look like? Who do I want to be dealing with? Um, probably one of the big things I noticed was that actually, you know, a lot of my clients in the UK were sort of investment bankers and corporate lawyers and whilst, you know, some of them are really nice people, um, a lot of them were just very money driven and um, probably didn't align with 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 my values and it wasn't particularly rewarding working with them. And so one of the big things I wanted to do differently here was just make sure that I was, you know, only working with people that, you know, you enjoyed their time and that you wanted to, to be spending, you know, time with and, and that you you genuinely wanted to to, to improve their lives. Um, 
so yeah, so started, um, you know, from from scratch. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to buy a book. I looked at sort of joining another financial planning firm, but it's kind of hard to start something when you've already made the decision to leave. <laughs> and I always knew yeah. I wanted to run my own. Always, always knew I wanted to run my own show. So um, started um, and took on sort of sixty-seven clients in sort of the first year. Um, sixty-seven. Just, that's, that's a that's a big effort from a standing start. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's why I know the number, actually. I think someone else sort of pointed it out to me at the time. But I, I guess I came from sort of an environment where you're you're used to sort of taking on lots of new clients. And when you don't have any, you can, you've can you got time to sort of find <laughs> new people. And, um, you know, it's, it's only really, you know, a couple of people a week, right? Like, you know, one to one and a half, you know, a week. And, and you sort of needed that, right? Like if you don't have any revenue to start, like <laughs> you, you, need to, you need to get busy. And, and I had... um. I did, I did have a bit of a rolling start because I, I, I took the time off and so I'd sort of spent some energy, you know, massaging the network and reconnecting. And, you know, I did, I did like a big launch event where I basically just put on drinks for kind of everyone I knew. You know, it was, I'd, I'd sort of been living overseas for, for a number of years and so it was like a, hey, I'm back, I've started this business, um, do you want to hear what I'm doing? Um, and then from that, you know, people were like, hey, I know someone or blah, 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 and, and it all spread. But uh, um, I think a lot of it probably helped also because – um, you know, I focus, you know, being a planner in the UK, that was sort of my strength and my experience. And so, um, you know, pretty much everyone that I met, particularly early doors, was a UK expat or had moved back from from the UK. And, and so there was a natural flow on from that. And um, I think in kind of trying to generate new people, like, you know, someone trying to get referrals on the basis of general financial planning can be quite tricky. But, you know, getting a referral for someone who used to live in the UK is very specific and, and easy for someone to sort of bring up in conversation. And I think also like sometimes clients want to refer you, but they don't know that you're looking for business. And mm. and I think as long as um, if they know that you're, you know, you're growing, you know, that you, you know, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're looking out for them. You know, you're showing them that you care, you know, you're proving that you, you, you know, you're knowledgeable and capable and interested um, and they know that you're looking for work. Like then it's amazing how many people are, are willing to, to refer you in and to willing to refer you sort of straight away, like very early in the process. Like I would say more than half of the times you receive a referral, it's before you've finished doing the initial work for someone. Yeah, totally. Uh, I've noticed that in my business and it's sort of like you obviously very much appreciated and you know that you are doing the right thing by the the referrer, but you sort of think like, well, they haven't, haven't even seen sort of the end product that you've got people going, oh yeah, this is great. You should need to talk to those guys. It's like, Okay, great. I appreciate the vote of confidence and um... yeah, it's 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 cool and and I think I guess a lot of the initial value is like sometimes people come into it and that whilst that they're, they're interested in getting advice, they are probably a little bit cynical and they've got that kind of voice in the back of their head, sort of thinking like, what's this going to be like? And you know, and then I think when when that experience is more positive than they expected, um, mm. you know, that they're, they're very willing to do that. And and I think if you can kind of take that momentum and then run with it, it's it seems easy to grow, but. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess over, over 10 years, I think a part of the challenge that I've sort of always had is, you know, we've kind of, we've always looked to sort of take on kind of 40 to 50 clients, um, you know, a year and have very quickly sort of tried to build a support team, um, you know, around us, uh, around me to, to sort of, to do that. But I think probably the biggest challenge I've always had, and I think it's a common thing that I think people get in planning is, um, the dependence on yourself. <laughs> and so moving from a sole planner, um, all the referral was going to sort of Scott Dawkins to um, a multiple planner. The referral was going to Griffin, you know, as, as the business. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably been a, a challenge that's taken a couple of goes at to sort of, to get right. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure you can relate, you know, in your business as well, Ben, but um, it, yeah. And I think, you know, just, you know, so we've looked to sort of, to be also like the structure at the moment, we've got um, there's another planner um, who we've sort of looked to transition a lot of the ongoing relationship work to, and and that's been um, that's gone for the most part I think you know really well. Like he, he'd sort of been an associate in the business for for a little while, and so he had a relationship with a lot of the clients um, already, and a lot of this was then just sort of transition, you know, making sure that the client knows that he's now like the key point of contact, and that I've not sort mm. of disappeared, but ultimately you can ask him anything that they need to, and and how to do that. And then, um, you know, to, to sort of help support that transition, I've got another associate to sort of support um, me more directly so that I'm not sort of leaning on the other advisor to sort of help me. 
um, have an office manager and then, um, you know, a couple of people in the Philippines that sort of help with sort of, sort of back office type stuff. And so, but yeah, it's been, a, it's been an interesting growth journey with like a few sort of waves and, and fits and starts. And um, generally always the, the easy bit I've probably found is actually finding the new work. It's more about how do you make sure that you're, you know, delivering on promises and meeting service standards and, you know, improving, you know, what's actually happening and um, without me always being the roadblock. Or without you having to be the one that's working 60, 70, 80 hours a week on top of that. So I'm keen to to dive into that a little bit deeper, but you touched on niching um, at the start. And I think that's something that gets a lot of airplay in, in advice and, and for good reason, in my view, I'm keen to hear though, obviously you've, you've cut out a bit of a, a specialty for yourself, being a planner in the UK, understanding the, the intricacies around there and, um, working with a lot of clients that that have those needs was that a purposeful thing when you started did you position the business in that way or is that just something that you've naturally gravitated to and um what have been the lessons around that for you yeah so it is something i did intentionally um mainly because it was like the main thing i had right so i i started planning in australia having never been a planner and so i i went straight from been an advisor in the UK in the time off that I took off between joint, I did sort of the, the relevant quals. Like I did a degree in finance and, and, and commerce, uh, whereas you probably couldn't, you, you can't do that now, right? Like I sort of started, you know, from, from day dot, set up a company, I had a license. I'd never been a planner in Australia before and I started my own business. And so, so when you've got zero clients and you're not looking to buy any, um, you know, and you've never been a planner in the country before, like it's sort of uh, having the niche that, that, is something that you you know it's like i i could be very good at that and i was you know i learned really quickly how to do all the australian aspects of that and spend a lot of energy in that while i was you know transitioning so um but i think you know in hindsight you look back at it and there's lots of other reasons why it sort of works really well i think so being a niche doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with people that fall outside of that like i think which is often the common misperception but it means that you're positioning yourself as an expert in in that area and these are the types and you can have more than one like we've probably got a few you know like we, we deal with a lot of young professionals so you know like my clients would typically be 35 to 50 um they'll often also be an expat and then you know we actually also do a lot of work with sort of same-sex couples as well and so if you get like a they can kind of sometimes be sort of all three <laughs> or they might be two of the three or they might be you know um just one but i think like having having a niche makes it really easy for someone to understand where you fit and if you're appropriate and with you go to that. And then if you've got something that you're concerned about, you want someone who, you know, generally speaking, they'll, they'll be like, oh, would well, you know anyone that can do this? And, mm. you know, I get a lot of work from other advisors as well in this space because they'll be like, oh, well, I've got this. I don't really understand it. And, you know, sometimes you can kind of do a one-off piece of advice for the client on that specific issue. Um, but you know, again, I think the more that someone knows you as something rather than, you know, like a, a GP type type character, I think the more likely you are to get, you know, referrals. And even for, um, you know, new centers of influence, like if you're trying to work with a, an accountant or a, you're a mortgage broker or another professional, like if they know specifics rather than like, I'll deal with any of your clients. It's more of a, yeah. um, you know, if you've got someone who's got this and this and this, that's where I'm I'm really good. And then you'll get all of those rather than, and then you'll probably still get people that are just looking for advice, but mm. you'll get all of the people that have got that kind of fit, you know, that, that, that character. And then if you do that well for them, they'll be like, start to think about it more. Whereas, you know, and, and again, I think it's also easy to be good at it if you're doing a narrower type of advice, right? Like it's sort of. Like totally. Sure. I, I think it, I think it allows you to become an expert in their problems. I think that's why people engage advisors is to solve problems. It could be the investment's not growing or got a tax issue or whatever. And uh, if you're dealing with the same problems day in and day out, you quickly become an expert in those problems. Whereas if you're yeah. solving different problems for different people all of the time and, and people can do that, but you're just seeing less of that stuff. Whereas you would know you get a expat that walks through your door it's like bang here's the seven things that you need to have you focus on and then you can help them with that so i think yeah. it allows for vol higher volume in in that problem solving but with a smaller number of clients and and trying to be all things to all people and i love what you said there for your clients that they can sort of 
hang their hat on that as well and say, well, yeah, these are the UK people or the, um, you know, they understand the issues of same-sex couples or whatever it is that instead of just saying, oh, this is a money person to go have a chat to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned at the start around starting with that blank blank piece of paper as well and I, I love that because you – I, I fully relate where you do get so caught up in your day to day that you're like, well, this is just the way that I, that we've done it. And sometimes when you do take a step back and realize that there are gaps or, or opportunities, what are the biggest things that surprised you after going through that exercise for you? <laughs> How little I wanted to do it the way that I had done it in my previous sort of stage of the career. Like it was one of those things where you know, we had a process, the process worked, you repeated it, you came in every day and that was sort of what you did. And and I think um, starting again without already being in flow with all of that from, from that just allowed you to be like, oh, hang on, actually, you know, this is the kind of people I want to be dealing with. This is the the types of advice that I want to provide. And this is how I think we should be structuring things. And, um, and the, you know, so a part of that was quite natural because I was, I left the country and mm. I was moving into a different advice system. And, and the UK at the time was still very much, um, it wasn't really like ongoing service fees. It was a lot of sort of upfront type work. And um, unless someone was sort of investing more money, um, there wasn't really a lot of review. So it was, you know, Australia was probably five years ahead of the UK in that part of that that journey. Um, mm. But, um, yeah, like it was it was surprising just how differently, you know, I wanted to do things. Um Whereas, you know, if I started my business in the UK, you, I would have probably just done it the same way, but just with a different name and different set of people and, <laughs> and whatnot. Um, it, like, and, and it was, you know, I guess it's exciting as well because you can kind of get, you can make it feel yours, like, and it makes it, and it yeah. really resonates with your own principles and 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 values and and goals and direction and, and stuff like that. So um, whereas when you're working for someone else, you know, it tends to be about money more, you know, like they, you know, it's like you need to be profitable to them, you know, within that business. Right. And so, um, so it was nice to sort of, you know, recreate and choose the way that you wanted to do things. And funnily enough that uh, when you make the decisions with that lens, that it tends to lead back to profitability. And I think yeah. you, you, know, you mentioned that you're onboarding 50, 60 clients a year, every year, but you're doing it when you've, you're focused on that, the client experience or not necessarily purely on the bottom line. Of course, you've got to focus on the bottom line because that's what business um, uh, needs to survive. But, um, yeah, it obviously hasn't impeded your ability to, you know, hit growth and grow your business, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's the thing. I think if, if your objective is money, you'll probably end up with less of it, I always found. Whereas if your goal is doing the right thing and you charge a, a fair and consistent fee for that, then – you'll probably be more profitable than if you're, you know, because I think I think the difference is like, um, I don't know, I remember getting asked once earlier in the career, like, how do you get so many referrals and do that? And it's like, well, you have to care. <laughs> and if you, you can't pretend that you care, like, because it's the genuine nature of your interaction with people that they resonate with. And that's what they enjoy. And if you um, can demonstrate that you actually do really want the best for them and you're you're able to you know you've got the capability and the experience to sort of to get the right questions coming out you know so that you you understand that person and if you can then articulate their problem better than they could probably themselves that's sort of what gets you know referrals but Mm. you can't you you have to be authentic i think about that like if you know people can think they can or not like they will in general and mass tell if you're just trying to to do the best thing for you rather than for them um but then ultimately that will lead you to more money anyway because people engage you and you know they refer you and you know you don't have to waste time and energy in in other areas Mm. and i think that that's what people get behind as well I, i don't know if it's a younger client thing i think it's an all people thing but I notice that um, we do a lot of work with younger people as well, and they seem to pick up on that. I don't know if it's if it's more or more quickly or more accurately or something, but um, they can. I don't know. They, they tend to to sense that, but yeah, I would agree with with that sentiment. So you mentioned about like your business has sort of grown along for a while, but it sounds like, and and we were just having a bit of a chat 
the other night at the the XY PD day um, after party event, and you were talking about the fact that it's been like off the back of COVID in the recent past that you've been more focused or um, yeah, more activity around your team growth, as you say, bring up your associate into an advisor role, bring another associate in, trying to um, ensure that you can continue growing your business, but without it being you, the, the one that's being the, the sole main driver of, of that work. What what have been the um, the lessons learned in, in that process for you? Yeah, I guess there's probably a couple of parts to that. So I think often what happens, business growth, even if the the client numbers are a straight line. Like it's business growth is rarely a straight line. It's often a, you know, you grow really, really quickly and then you've got to put a lot of money in investing into the business mm. and then it'll flatline for a little bit and then you'll grow really quickly again and then it'll sort of flatline and then you'll grow quickly again. And so you have, I guess, different waves of of growth. And we, we probably got to a point where um, we'd sort of invested heavily into sort of systems and processes. And, and I think COVID probably... Um, sort of forced that upon us in in a lot of ways where um you know because we went we went basically instantly working remote for the all of 2020 and we had we had a well-established team and so that worked really well and we um you know well well we understood each other we bonded well but i think when you're not there face to face like you realize you your systems and processes need to be really slick Solid. otherwise yeah. things are going to be exposed pretty pretty mm-hmm. quickly and i think in doing that you know, it helps you sort of identify who's doing what and who should be doing what. And, um, you know, I've constantly had the mindset of like a, um, you know, I, I only want to be doing the things and, and for the team, like I only want them to be doing the things that they're good at and that they enjoy. Um, you know, maybe spend a little bit of time on stuff that they're good at but don't enjoy. Um, but like I don't want them doing things that they aren't good at and don't like or that they mm. ideally just don't like. And, and you know, that's when we sort of build in, you know, some more, you know, we, we took on an extra person in the back office from in the Philippines to sort of pick up a lot of the things that the Australian-based team um, didn't want to do. Um, and then I guess, the, the you know, I guess going through that process, it really firmed up our ability to sort of to take on new work. And then, again, just I was working too hard. And so I guess my lesson in that is just delegate more and earlier. Um, I've always struggled by holding on to things. Like I... I, I do care and I do like my clients like as people and and as the part of part of the challenge of that is I've sort of struggled initially to sort of let go so I tried to we did our first wave of trying to transition clients across and I, I didn't really let go <laughs> and as a, as a result of that you know it took a long time to get traction and I think um, as soon as you you know once I did actually get to the point where I let, I let go and I let Josh run with it he did phenomenally well and it was one of those mm. things where um, you know, actually they're probably almost better served by him because I've got a million other things that I'm doing and, and he's got a smaller number of clients at this stage. And so he's going to be more responsive and get back to them faster and, you know, ask the right questions. Whereas if I'm trying to juggle everything, then I can't do that well, even if I'm the person who had the relationship in the beginning. But, and so, yeah, I think if I was to do it again, I'd definitely look to, to delegate more earlier and, um, you know, not be reckless with it, but I think to to trust in the people, um, tr- trust in the process, and then make sure that, you know, you're communicating it appropriately to the client. Um, and then get out of the way, which is the hard part. I've, I've yeah. certainly been in the, in the same position. And I think you, especially when you're the founder and you sort of the driver of a lot of those things that you have things that you would, typically put into an email or a document or a conversation or whatever. And then some, everyone's different. So they would do things a little bit differently. And I know for me, that's like one of my big limiting beliefs, not just for my work, but across life. It's like, I feel like there's a particular way that things should be done. And if they're not done in that particular way, I'm like, shit, that's not getting done the right way, but everyone's got their own way. And, um, you know, as long as they're getting to the same outcomes and the clients are getting the results that they come to us for, then, how you get there is that's okay. And, and like you say that your, if your attention is on, you're, you're watching the PL, you're doing like marketing or marketing growth, team development, all of these things that it means that you can, while you might, you know, if, if being an advisor was your only job that you're probably going to do it incredibly well and, and perhaps better than someone else in your team, but it's not. 
So it means that your clients yeah. are probably better served by having someone that uh, where it is their their only lane, they then know that they can draw on you for support when that is needed. Um, ultimately, clients looked after better, and it, that supports uh, the business growth. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I think uh, I guess the more um, the more time that you can free up, you know, for you to be able to do other things, you know. And again, and it, I guess it depends on what role you want in the business. But again, I, I want to be able to help more people, and, and I think there's lots of people that need advice. And I feel like um, there's a lot of you know a lot of places where people were, get, were getting advice from before that that are no longer options for them and and ultimately um there's only so many people that i can help so we need to grow the team in order to be able to do that and and as long as you're giving them sufficient support and so so one of the that probably one of the other things that i sort of um put in place um that i think really helped is i sort of blocked out two mornings a week like for, for three hours just to sort of work on um work on the business type stuff so like no meeting time just uh, you know dedicated time that is supposed to be for, for things that is, you know, I guess improving, improving the business as a whole rather than sort of doing, you know, for year and in work type type stuff like, or, or like client meetings or all that type of stuff. And um, whilst I, I took a little while to honor it and I don't, I don't always honor it, I think just having that as the constant reminder to sort of be giving yourself time for that. And I, and I think that, yeah, and I feel like my value could probably be much greater in the business if I was maybe more true to that and then allowed to, you know, mm. more yeah, it's hard to, it is definitely hard to find that time. I know I try to do all Tuesdays, I block out for no meetings and that's my mm. on the business time because I find that if I end up stacked with meetings on Monday and then Tuesday, I feel like the week is halfway gone and then I haven't got anything done and I get super frustrated. So blocking that bit of time at the front end of the week means that I can, you know, have conversations with the team or um, work on a marketing initiative or a partnership thing or a bit of content or whatever, uh, you need to do that because it's like we just tend to consume what we've got to work with. And if you don't have barriers around your time, then uh, you just get stacked and then you're so caught in day-to-day that you you never yeah, yeah. end up moving. And, you know, like, and, like I, I have four kids and a dog and I like to do other things. Like it, So it's, yeah, like you want to you want to be able to have time, you know, for yourself too, right? Like, and so this you're not useful to, to anyone if you're sort of always doing sort of 60, 70 hours a week. Mm, absolutely. And so on the team stuff, if 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 you were to go back to the start, is there is there anything um, other than the, the delegate faster? Is there anything else that you do differently? I, I think I think that's probably the big thing. Like, I think um, I feel like I, I did that well early, and then I sort of stagnated with it and. I had sort of a false start with a, an advisor initially, and then I was probably a bit slow to to pick it up again. But that's probably the big thing. Like I've I've just struggled to let go of enough. Like, uh, and, and I think the the more that you can kind of delegate responsibly um, earlier, then then I think that's the better. Whereas, because um, particularly with client work, like back office stuff, I think is really really obvious and really easy to do. But mm. um, the client contact, and so being comfortable with it not being you. <laughs> or not being exactly the way that you do it, like what you were saying, yeah. but it being a way that is still a good way and with the right mindset and and because um, it's, you know, again, and putting the energy into training on that rather than to, you can't sort of expect change without changing the inputs, you know, or or changing the energy, right? So if, um, if you're not providing kind of the right kind of feedback or development or support, then you can't expect a different result. Um, yeah. And so probably more of that sooner. Like, I love that. And the, one of the things that I've learned over the last little bit is just having that clear, like, yes, having the training support, but having a structured approach to, to doing that to say, okay, every role in the business, what are the outcomes that we need from that role? Okay. It's these meetings or this retention or these SLAs around these particular tasks. And then on from day one, you can just say, Hey, okay, th- this is the outcomes that we need for you and your role. We're not expecting you to do it tomorrow, but we are expecting you to do it in 90 days or, you know, whatever the time period is. Then you can build your training plan around that. It needs to be flexible, obviously, to shift things based on the individual, based on what's going on in the business. But at least then you've got the goalposts to work towards sort of like what we do with our clients. Yeah, and that's probably the other thing that you've sort of prompted with me there. I think, you know, I've kind of always had a documented business plan and we've sort of refreshed it a little bit, but I've only really just recently started sharing that more deeply with with the team, and particularly around sort of like the you know the quarterly 
goals and targets and, and projects that we're sort of working on. And, and I think that's been a, um, you know, the, probably the last 18 months has been a, a real positive um, influence in sort of everyone feeling like they're on the same, you know, journey and going to the same place yeah. rather than um, it's sort of been like, you know, there's a clear goal and there's a clear plan, but it's just in my head. It's yeah. more about um, making sure, okay, like, is everyone on the same boat going to the same place? Like, and, and, and I think, you know, sharing freely, like, you know, numbers and targets and, you know, ratios and, um, you know, projects. Um, so, yeah, I, the other thing that we probably started to, in, in, um, to do during COVID as well was like quarterly, quarterly catch ups where we sort of just work on a process in the business. And so we'd choose, you know, it might be like the review process or the, the onboarding process and mm. we would just sort of spend three or four hours um you know as a whole team because because we were working remotely um it was a really good chance to get everyone back together um mm. and to do that and would just sort of break it apart and be like hey well are we happy with this and is there anything that needs to change or whose responsibility is this and should it still be theirs or you know how can we enhance this experience or you know that kind of stuff and and sort of once a quarter and we still do that now and i think it's been it's been really good as a way to get together and, and the chance to sort of be like okay well not try to rebuild everything from scratch but mm. just look at forcing yourself to be thinking of a continuous improvement you know like what how do we do things a little bit better um what is there a, you know a part of the process that we change or can we systemize it or streamline it or are we getting the best use out of our technology or software or those, those types of types of things and so and then planning it quite intentionally so we have sort of a list of projects for the year that we're working through and then we make sure that's then incorporated into that. And then, and then we'll go out and do like a, you know, nice long lunch and, or an activity or, or something as well um, at the end of it and hope that someone's taking good notes so that they, <laughs> um, but yeah. um, I feel like it's kind of, yeah, it's really bettered that sort of um, continuous improvements, pursuit of excellence type um, approach, you know, across the board rather than just my own expectations um, yeah. that are inside I've my head. I love that, and and what I've found, we do similar things from time to time in at Pivot, and it, what it gives is the team ownership of the the processes. Because I'm a bit of a process nut, and I build out all these processes, and the, you know, then then everyone else just has to follow them. But when you go, okay, well, here it is. What what do we need to change? What's working? What's not working? What do we do differently? And then they go, okay, well, actually, this, this, and this, and then all of a sudden, it's no longer my process, but it's their process and our yeah. process. And then they get um, they get behind it more and follow along more. It gets that collaborative, the the continuous improvement, but it's them driving and not thinking that it's you know something that just comes down from up high and um, you know they're just expected yeah. to follow without any input. Absolutely, I think yeah, delegated accountability. I think because one of the one of the first things that I always did wrong was like ultimately. I was the person accountable for everything. Yeah. So like the other people that would be doing the parts of it, but ultimately if that, if it didn't get done or did get done, like it was, it was sort of like, it stopped with, with me. Whereas mm -hmm. I think, and like what you're saying, you want to delegate the responsibility or the accountability for the different functions to people, you know, in the team. So it's not, again, it's not something which like you obviously still have an input and you care about it and you're, you're putting energy into it, but it's ultimately it's the, you know, someone else in the team that has, some accountability for it themselves so that um again that you, you're getting a, a stronger a stronger buy-in and also freeing up your own headspace mm, <laughs> like, totally you you want it to be our business coach talks about like you don't want to be the one waking up in the middle of the night thinking you know is this thing done or is that uh outcome being delivered you want someone else not that you want your team waking up in the middle of the night but it's you know analogy for them that you want it on on yeah. them you're there obviously to support but they're the ones that are owning it. Um, and then they feel that they've got that ownership as well, which I think is is super helpful. Scott, um, my last question for you is well, what's coming up for you? What are you what are you sort of focused on over the next little while? Yeah, um, good question. So I think um, we've got, I feel like I've got a couple of hires left, you know, within the business. So um, we, we've had a really good year um, this year. Like we've, we've sort of grown close to 30% actually. And and I think with that, we'd sort of done a lot of the back work in sort of, you know, in building capacity. But I think 
I'm, I'm, you know, again, looking for a couple of new people, I think, in the team. So probably like a CSO and then like a, a practice manager at that sort of more senior operational leadership kind of kind of role um, so that we can kind of continue, you know, continue growth. So I feel like we've got, I've got a fairly kind of ambitious sort of five-year plan, you know, for um, for the business. And we're sort of, you know, 18 months into to that part of that journey and, you um, you know, hit target for the first financial year um, already. So that's that's been encouraging. But it, it, again, it's just about how do we make sure that, um, again, I, I'd like to be sort of probably more 50% on the tools and 50% running the business um, by this time sort of next year. And so needing some some greater support within the business to sort of to do that. But um, it feels like a really exciting time. Like I, I know I was chatting to you about it at the, at the drinks, but I think um, given the, the amount of change that the industry has gone through and everything that's happening, like, I feel like it's it's probably the best time there's almost ever been to be an advisor right now. Like it's uh, like advisor numbers are down. There's, there's lots happening in, in the world and people are, people generally seek advice. Um, and if you've got a business that you've got strong processes in place and you can kind of deal with the, the mountains of changing requirements that we've had to, to cope with over the, the last sort of five years, probably in particular, like if you've survived that, <laughs> Like now it's the time to thrive, I think. And so, I don't know, I feel um, really enthusiastic and excited yeah. about the kind of the opportunity that's in front of us from where from where we are. So it's just, just I guess, taking advantage of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think that there is that groundswell for consumers and more people are getting great advice and then they're, they're, they're sort of um, spreading the word about that. And I've been saying for a long time, I'd love to get to a point where, you know, if people are out of shape with their physical health, then, you know, the sort of society knows and then they're saying, why don't you, you know, get a PT or, you know, do that thing that you need to do to get there. I think money is something that we don't um, talk about so much, but it's also just not saying like, you know, if you, you everyone's got a mate that's, that's finance is probably way out of whack, but we don't say, oh, you have to go get a financial planner. I think if yeah. that changed um, and it is changing, but um yeah, it, it's mm. great for everyone. So it is certainly yeah. exciting times ahead. But yeah, I so, feel like we're on the right side of that that transition. Whereas I think I think um, the industry is it has changed and is changing quite quite mm. dramatically. I feel like that's starting to be meaningfully felt. Um, mm. on the last, yeah, at least from my perception. So it's absolutely. Yeah. For, so for anyone that's interested to learn more about some of the opportunities that you might have coming up, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Uh, so probably just through the website. So uh, griffinfinancialservices.com.au is the website. So reach out there. Awesome, mate. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Look forward to continuing to see you kick goals into the future, mate. And we'll catch you on the next one. Sounds good.